chapter 6. So, have you done a risk assessment for this? Asked Danny, panting slightly under the weight of the camera. Oh, uh, what? I answered, pretending not to hear him properly, and thereby buying myself a few valuable seconds. A risk assessment. Why do we need one of those all of a sudden? We were about to do a very simple shot from the roof of the house. I appreciated that Danny had been a bit shaken by the car excitements from earlier, but all we were doing was plonking the camera on a very flat bit of roof and pointing it at the driveway. It wasn't as if I was asking him to attempt a shot while abseiling naked down the side of an erupting volcano, though on another occasion it would have been rather fun to watch him try that. A risk assessment, Danny repeated, for shooting on the roof. Oh yeah, don't don't worry, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, sorted. I deliberately mumbled while shifting a heavy and cumbersome tripod onto my other shoulder. Having hurtled down to meet the shoot crew, I had swiftly organised the roof assault team for a rapid ascent. I was convinced that despite the arrival of the hunt's vanguard, there was still time to get the shot we needed before the driveway was choked with dogs, horses and sherry-drinking knobs in stupid hats. Okay, so I wasn't exactly convinced, but a strange manic drive had by now taken possession of me, and I was determined to give it a go. In sharp contrast, Steve had an air that was decidedly chilled and will of Allah about him. Having been through this all before, he obviously knew that this sort of lunacy was pretty much standard fare. Right, everyone, I announced to the little troop of heavily laden Sherpas strung out behind me. We've got a fairly narrow spiral staircase ahead, so do watch your footing. Are you sure you really need me, James? asked Toby, straining under the weight of assorted sound and camera equipment. Yes, we do, interjected Danny firmly. We'll need some wild track. What, a bit of wind? I could do that from the comfort of my bedroom by sticking a mic out of the window. Yes, you could do that, Toby, Danny retorted. But then you'd merely end up with a recording of farm traffic and Mrs Miggins's septic cat coughing up fur balls. Not exactly what the director will need for the sound edit, I imagine. Having fired off a couple of rounds at Toby, Danny rapidly adjusted his sights and refocused on his main target. So, James, do you have the paperwork for that, then? What, the uh, risk assessment thing? Yes. Well, not on me, Danny. Uh, No. Right, well, perhaps you could show it me before we go ahead with the shot, then. I smelt the cloying odour of something that had been steadily stewing. After that morning's run-in, it was pretty obvious that one of Danny's chosen weapons for our little jewels was going to be health and safety. It was a good choice for him, too, as I was painfully aware that we had made little provision for that sort of thing. We did, for example, have a first aid kit, but I wasn't going to start kidding myself that a roll of bandage, some plasters and a small tube of ointment would have saved the day if George's wayward driving had decapitated half the crew. Tell you what, Danny, I said, attempting to parry his latest thrust. Because we're a bit up against it time-wise for this shot, um, can I get that paperwork to you later today? Sure, OK, came Danny's somewhat surprising reply. Strange. Danny knew that I knew that he knew that no such risk assessment actually existed. But for some reason, he had momentarily let me off the hook. I felt not unlike a baby seal that, having been tossed repeatedly into the air by a killer whale, had suddenly been left to bob along the waves unmolested. But then, as noted in the BBC's award-winning Natural History series, Mammals Can Be Right Bastards, I knew there was a strong likelihood that the Danny Whale was merely toying with me and would soon be slapping me around again as a prelude to digesting me whole. After much chivying, bullying and banging of expensive camera equipment against flesh and stone, I managed to get the crew up onto the roof and quickly led Steve and Danny over to the little platform that would serve as the camera setup. So, happy with this then? Yeah, fine, whatever, opined Steve with little opinion on the matter. Hmm, deliberated Danny, obviously keen not to sound too keen. After all, this camera position had been thrust upon him without referral, debate or sacrificing a small child to the gods of cinematography. And so he was hardly going to go, Whoop! Whoop! Brilliant! Fantastic choice, Mr Producer! Hey, who needs little old me when you're clearly so brilliant at doing my job? Danny began to conduct his own little impromptu risk assessment. I was fairly confident that the platform wasn't going to suddenly give way, causing an avalanche of crew and kit off the roof of the house, but as I watched Danny carry out some CSI-style forensic tests on the 300-year-old brickwork, 
I was gripped with an irrational moment of self-doubt. I also realised that with one effortless flick of his monstrous tail, the Danny Whale was cruising back towards me. I inched my way over to the parapet to check on the final resting place of the recently arrived horse carrier. As luck would have it, it had parked up close enough to the house to be out of shot. Even though I could see another hunt landing craft on its way down the drive, it was possible that as long as the trickle of vehicles didn't turn into a sudden flood, we could still conceivably, theoretically, maybe, get a clear shot of the car on the drive. It was time to get the rest of the troops in position, which meant the added bonus of getting to play with the walkie-talkie. Earlier, I had stumbled on the full walkie-talkie kit, which included a holster and belt attachment. With my recently purloined fluorescent high-vis jacket, and now the full walkie-talkie ensemble, I was at least, so I thought, starting to look the part of a first AD. Confidence is 90% of the job, I had told myself, even though this was a totally spurious statistic based upon some utter bollocks of mine, at that particular moment it made me feel good to cuddle up and embrace it. With a dramatic flourish, I deftly drew the radio out of my low-slung holster, brought it up to my ear and hit the speaker button. For a fleeting moment, I felt like I was actually in control of something. Andy, are you receiving me? I coolly and concisely barked. Yep, loud and clear, came Andy's reply. The roof was now the bridge of an 18th century flagship, and I was master and commander, issuing orders for my fleet. It felt really good to be striding assertively amongst my crew at last. It was about time they saw me brimming with authority. Now, listen, Andy, I want you to drive up with George and Sarah to the end of the drive and await our queue, I said. Got that? Sure. Uh, Only, said Andy before disappearing. Either Andy had wandered out of range, his battery had died, or something bad had happened and he had bottled it. Only what, Andy? I persisted. Only, um, George isn't here. Over? What? I spat incredulously while coming to an abrupt halt. So where is he then? Someone dropped him off back at his hotel. He he said he had some lines to learn. Did anyone tell him that he was needed for the next shot? I said to the accompaniment of rising hackles and soaring blood pressure. Well, uh, yes, I did tell him, but but I think he was under the impression that his stand-in could do it. His what? His stand-in. He doesn't have a stand-in, Andy. None of the actors do. Oh, sorry, I I didn't realise. George seemed pretty convinced that he had one. Yes, well, he would, wouldn't he? That's because he thinks he's Laurence fucking Olivier. Who? said Andy. Oh, never mind. I hung up and noticed that the crew were all staring at me. Having forced marched everyone onto a freezing cold roof, it probably wasn't the wisest move to have had the above interchange broadcast so loudly in front of a weary and hungry crew. By now, everyone had to be aware that the shooting schedule for day one lay in tatters. In fact, the only thing in the can was a single shot from scene three. That was a bit of scene three from a shooting script that contained a total of 210 scenes. At the rate we were going, it would take nine months rather than the scheduled three weeks to get through the complete script. Having realised my mistake, I attempted to rally the troops with a painfully sad little lie. It's okay, everyone, I announced. Carry on. Everything's everything's going to plan. I smiled at Toby, whose general countenance had become a handy barometer of the crew's mood. Toby tilted his head up and raised a single eyebrow. Clearly, he was thinking, Bullshit. Fucking George. During what part of our negotiations was there ever a mention of George having a stand-in? Was a boutique hotel with Wi-Fi, a well-stocked cellar, a five-star rated restaurant and a clutch of attractive sycophantic staff to do his every bidding not enough? I was damned if we were going to lose this shot after all my efforts. There was no time to dispatch someone to retrieve George, which meant there was only one real option left. I'd have to stand in for the fucker. Steve, we've lost George, so I'm going to have to stand in for him. OK, said Steve, characteristically unfazed by this latest twist. Uh, just make sure you look a bit like him. It's going to be a fairly long shot, but we're still going to make out the basic stuff, you know, like shirt, tie and beard, said Diane, highlighting a fairly obvious difference between George and I. Oh, yeah. Good point, Diane, said Steve. If you can, James, see if you can get some rapid growth out of your chin in the next five minutes. Right, I said, turning to go. I managed all of two steps before something killer whale-like launched itself at me from out of the shallows.
Look, James, I've taken a look at the masonry supporting the proposed shooting platform, and I have to say I'm just not at all happy with it from a safety point of view. I just don't think it's going to take the weight of the combined camera and crew. I took a deep breath, and in the two seconds I had available to me, played my hand. Look, Danny, please, can you do this for me? Look, we we need this shot today before we lose the car, and and, and I appreciate the risk you may be taking, but we we really have no other choice. In retrospect, I like to think that I won this particular battle because I A. Acknowledged the risks involved B. Highlighted the practical necessity of getting the shot and C. Sufficiently prostrated myself on the ground before Danny with a humiliating and whiny Please! All right, given the circumstances, I'll agree to take the shot, Danny said after a much laboured and ostentatious pause. But can you let it be noted that I wasn't at all happy to go ahead given these circumstances? Thanks, Danny, I said, giving him a firm appreciative pat on the arm. My thanks were genuine and heartfelt, as I was not yet unhinged with a burning desire to smother Danny while he slept. That time was to come, of course, but at this stage of the game Danny's mask hadn't slipped to reveal the pointy horns and malevolent grin of the devil incarnate. James, we've got a couple more arrivals, said Steve, looking in the direction of the drive. You better shake a leg. Sure, sure, I'm on it, I said, finally abandoning the bridge and disappearing down into the bowels of the ship. Chapter 7 Okay, I'm set. Right, stand by, James, came the barely audible crackle of Andy's voice a good half a mile away. I looked across at Sarah, who was still struggling to contain her giggles. It was a shame not to share the joke, but unfortunately, an earlier casualty of the shoot had been my sense of humour. Still, I couldn't exactly blame her for being tickled at my expense. I must have looked a right prat, sat there with a makeshift beard of dyed cotton wool stuck to my face. It didn't help that every time I moved, another bit of wool would come unstuck and roll down my recently acquired white shirt, leaving a small trail of black poster paint in its wake. Okay, James, we're just waiting for a Range Rover to clear the drive ahead of you, and then we should be ready to rock and roll, continued an ebullient Andy, obviously enjoying the fact that he had successfully usurped me and was back directing the talent. Right, okay, understood, I said grumpily, miffed by my sudden relegation from fleet commander to that of comedy beard stand-in. You're a molting, Sarah said between spasms of giggles. Y- yes, I, I know I'm molting, I replied without smiling. Still, uh, n- not a bad approximation of George, she just about managed to say before erupting with snot and laughter. It was certainly one of those occasions where a lack of sense of humour on my part only added to the overall comedic effect for my passenger. There was me, still sweating after tearing through the house and plundering a white shirt and tie from wardrobe, cotton wool from makeup, and poster paint and glue from the props department. The more I attempted to remain dignified and professional in front of Sarah, the more ludicrous I grew in her eyes. Right, uh, Sarah, I said, turning to face her and pointedly ignoring another paint-soaked bit of beard that was working its way down my shirt. I'm not sure how long this shot is going to be, but perhaps we should engage in some animated discussion as we approach the house, you know, to add authenticity. Sarah nodded with exaggerated earnestness, but it was obvious from the tears welling up in her eyes that she was having a monumental struggle not to guffaw violently in my face. I checked myself out in the rear-view mirror and concluded that Even though my faux beer did indeed make me look like a pantomime pirate gone badly wrong, it would probably just about work for this long shot. Obviously, any mid- or close-up shots, and it may have been tricky to convince an audience that it was Bob and not Blackbeard that was driving up to the house. Okay, James, begin your approach now, came the distinctly authoritative voice of Andy. I should have been pleased that our boy Wonder had grown so impressively in stature since we had employed him as a lowly production assistant a mere seven hours ago. But instead, my battered ego would only allow me to mutter under my breath, A please wouldn't go amiss, Andy. I placed the walkie-talkie on my lap and eased the car forward along the drive, 
occasionally checking my rearview mirror for enemy horse trailers. Go, go faster, James, crackled Andy from between my legs, which was weird. I pressed down on the accelerator and, instantaneously, two things happened. Firstly, the front near-side wheel spun wildly, violently shifting our direction of travel so that we were now heading onto the grass, and secondly, a good bucketful of brown, moist matter splattered across the bonnet and onto the windscreen. Shit! I exclaimed, wrestling the car back onto the road. Undoubtedly, Sarah concurred with a big smirk. James, can you keep the car on the drive? said Andy. And can you get that uh, stuff off the windscreen? Horse shit! I yelled into the radio. Sorry? said Andy, taken aback. It's horse shit and it's all over the front of the car. How do you know it's horse shit? Because I'm the producer, Andy, and I know my shit. That's why. Look, are we still rolling? Yes, that's an affirmative, James. If you can just clear that stuff off the windscreen. It's not stuff, Andy, I exclaimed, cutting in again with my pedantic correction. I told you, it's recently shat horse shit and it's all over the front of the car. Surely that means we need to cut. No, we don't. If we can clear it, we might get the shot before we run out of road, said Andy. Right, right, w- we'll do, I replied, suddenly remembering that with vehicles arriving fairly regularly now, the window of opportunity for getting this shot was about to close. Stop using the radio, James, came a sudden command from Steve. It's clearly in shot. Yes, OK, Steve, I lashed out defensively. I, I was just responding to Andy. You don't need to respond to Andy, chipped in Danny. You just need to drive the car. Ah! I exclaimed in frustration. I so wanted to have the last word. I so wanted to scream into the radio. Will everyone just fuck off? This isn't even my fucking job. But by this point, Sarah had had the good sense to gently unpeel the radio from my clammy hand and toss it out of harm's way onto the back seat. With only a couple of hundred yards to go before reaching the house, I frantically yanked at the small forest of levers protruding from the driving column until I finally got the windscreen wipers to work. This had the effect of removing most of the shit, but still left a very nasty smear on the glass. Sixty seconds later, we pulled up outside the house and awaited the inevitable call. OK, James, said Andy. Can you get back to your first position, please? I scooped up the radio from the back seat and attempted a brief post-mortem. Did you manage to get anything usable, Andy? No, too much shit flying around, summarised Steve rather neatly. And by the way, any chance you can do this take without randomly turning on the indicators, screen wash and headlights? Uh, sure, I said sheepishly, before adding, so uh, what do you think of the beard? Oh, the beard, it's, it's rubbish, said Steve. But fortunately, the reflection on the screen means we can't really see you. For some reason, I found this fact very depressing. Sarah, on the other hand, virtually creamed herself. Chapter 8 So there's no dairy products in here at all, inquired Sasha. That's right, replied Kevin, the chef. No meat or dairy, which means it's suitable for both vegetarians and uh, vegans alike. Sasha still didn't look that convinced by the dish on offer and bent down to give it a good old prod and smell. I wasn't that convinced by either, but for completely different reasons. Contrary to Sasha's needs, my body was aching for comfort food, and ideally something that had been freshly slain and slipped in between two chunks of processed to oblivion white bread. Unfortunately, the meat tray had already been ransacked by a passing pack of carnivorous crew, leaving me with a stark choice of either rabbit food or starvation. Faced with a trough of vegan swill, starvation certainly looked like the better option. Uh, has it got honey in it? asked Sasha, her investigative nostrils virtually snorting up the dish. Uh, a little bit, yes, said Kevin, his assuredness wavering in the face of Sasha's scrutiny. Sasha reacted to this ingredient update by taking a large, evasive step backwards. Oh, she declared with undisguised revulsion, before covering her mouth with her hand. Kevin looked at me as if to say, what the fuck? 
I looked back at him as if to say, Fuck knows. Oh, and have you got a secret stash of burgers? Are you allergic to honey? asked Kevin. No, it's not an allergy, came Sasha's curt response. I'm vegan. Yes, but don't vegans eat honey? Some do. I I don't. Let love, I can guarantee you that no bees were killed, maimed or made homeless during the extraction process. (laughs) Does that help? Sasha chose to ignore Kevin's little inflammatory line in sarcasm and instead decided to bring this matter officially to the producer's attention. James, didn't I tell you I was vegan when I accepted this job? She said. Um, I believe so, yes, I answered. So wasn't this fact communicated to the caterers? Uh, Yes, I said, giving Kevin an acknowledging but awkward smile. But I don't think the um, honey thing specifically was, you know, mentioned as such. Sorry, James, but I think I did specifically mention it, she said. As a strict vegan, I am against all cruelty inflicted on animals. Right, yes. Um, But um, don't the bees produce honey sort of, you know, voluntarily? I suggested gingerly. Yeah, it's not as if they get squeezed like toothpaste to get it out, added Kevin somewhat unhelpfully. Sasha, who wasn't exactly blessed with rosy cheeks, had turned virtually translucent since her close encounter with the dish and I genuinely feared she would crumble like a flake the next time someone brushed lightly past her. This whole honey issue was very annoying, as I had put in a huge amount of effort to get the catering spot on and to cater to everyone's culinary needs. In fact, when apportioning the film's meagre budget to various departments, I had been staggered to discover that food would be the single biggest cost, tempting though it had been to save thousands of pounds by offering everyone a daily diet of marmite sandwiches and twiglets something told me that decent and more importantly hot food would be appreciated if not totally expected little did i realize that in the coming days and weeks of an increasingly bloody campaign just how important a factor like food would become a film crew like an army marches on its stomach screw up the provisions and any bubbling undercurrent of discontentment will soon boil over into a full-blown throw-the-producer-over-the-side mutiny. Do you know how many bees are lost during the cultivation of honey? asked Sasha. Kevin and I were stumped. It wasn't one of those questions that regularly comes up in pub quizzes. Uh, three billion? Kevin blurted out. Sasha remained silent. Obviously, Kevin's guess was way off the mark. Uh, tw- uh, 20%. I ventured, erring on what I hoped was the safer side of percentages. Sasha didn't respond, and Kevin and I were left dangling in suspense. Finally, she came clean. Well, I don't know exactly how many perish, but I do know that it is a lot, she said. Was that it? Was that the best Sasha could come up with? I suddenly felt immensely irritated with Sasha for being so vague about her bee fatality facts. If I was going to waste precious minutes attempting to appease her over something as mind-numbingly trite as honey, then at the very least she should have the decency to know her stats on the matter. Tell you what, love, um, look, I'll, I'll see if I can quickly rustle up an alternative for you, said Kevin, taking control of the situation and allowing me to move on to more pressing matters, such as getting to grips with the bigger picture. The bigger picture happened to feature the rather alarming fact that we were now a good three hours behind schedule with only two shots in the actual can. Grabbing a banana and a handful of penguins, uh, that's the chocolate ones, not the cute flightless ones, though I was that hungry for flesh that I probably would have happily chomped my way through Pingu and his chums, I walked over to where Steve and Diane were sat on a small sofa, their laps covered in paperwork. My palms began to moisten as I spotted a heavily annotated copy of my schedule lurking amongst the pile. So Steve, um, happy with that top shot then? I said, hoping this would give me access to the impromptu and, frankly, intimate meeting currently being carried out between director and continuity lady. I was still, sadly, insecure enough in my job to be threatened by the professional bond that obviously existed between them. They were already veterans of another filmmaking conflict and... Based on my badly mauled schedule for day one, I was worried that they might just gang up and tell me to bugger off back to making cheap and cheerful pop videos. Yeah, it was uh, it was fine, said Steve, glancing briefly in my direction. I watched nervously for a moment as Diane squiggled some undecipherable notes into her sacred continuity file. In my mind, she may still have been nothing more than a member of the filmmaking chorus, 
a mere glorified spear carrier, but she exuded a professional gravitas that deeply unnerved me. Humming with paranoia, I was convinced that these notes, roughly translated, would read like some grisly school report. The producer tries hard, but his knowledge and aptitude for the job is sadly lacking. It is my professional opinion that perhaps he would be better suited in a less demanding role. A runner, perhaps, or an assistant to a runner. Alternatively, he could listen to his mother for a change and apply for that place at teacher training college. I decided to join the meeting by squeezing my way onto the micro-sofa. After a couple of minutes of copious shuffling of buttocks, I managed to wedge myself tightly in between the two of them. "'Gosh, this this is cosy, I said, in an attempt to alleviate any embarrassment that Diane might be experiencing now that I had welded myself onto her right thigh. Uh, "'Yes, it is,' she answered, unable to fully turn her head to face me. "'So, uh, how are we doing, guys?' I inquired, struggling to unzip the banana without inadvertently chinning Diane in the process. Steve scratched his head and stared blankly at a scribble-scarred page of the schedule. Diane took a deep breath, and I instinctively braced myself for a response that would no doubt carry the choice phrase, gone to utter rat shit, in it. Well, um, as I was pointing out to Steve, we're obviously a bit behind on the schedule for today, Diane answered, with an easygoingness that surprised me. As author of what I now knew to be an obscenely optimistic film schedule, I was at the very least expecting some kind of verbal thrashing from our resident seasoned pro. I still had no real idea what Diane did, short of the tie and cushion adjustment duties mentioned earlier, but she definitely knew stuff, and it was clearly the sort of stuff that had been instrumental in helping Steve over the finishing line with his previous film. Now we need to get this lot out there as soon as poss, said Steve nervously tapping his foot while pointedly staring at the various crew members now comfortably submerged in various shapes and shades of plump upholstery. Yeah, that's that, that's probably a good idea, Steve, continued Diane, speaking with the even measured tone of someone totally confident in her own abilities and with absolutely nothing to prove. But you might also want to consider trimming some of the dialogue in these um, these driving scenes and perhaps lose some of the car approach coverage. What do you think, Steve? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, let's let's do that, shall we? Said Steve, instantaneously embracing these suggestions. I got the feeling that if Diane had suggested we dispensed altogether with the actors and shot the rest of the film using finger puppets and fuzzy felt, Steve would have concurred with equal zest and enthusiasm. Right, well, decision made then, I said, relieved that some sort of contingency plan had been hatched that might just put us back on track. Good, I'm going to the lure, then let's get cracking before we completely lose the light, said Steve, levering himself out of the sofa. Uh, I don't suppose you fancy outlining some of those cuts in more detail, do you, uh, Diane? I timidly suggested. Um, I think that's more of a job for the director and producer, James, Diane said, in a tone that prompted me to recall my feeling like a bit of a tit moment when I had previously asked her to be our first AD. Script changes are creative decisions that only you two can really make, she added, without any trace of condescension or weariness in her voice. Which, on reflection, was admirable, considering the level of production of fuckwittery she was encountering on pretty much an hourly basis. Yes, of course, I reluctantly acknowledged. Uh, Steve, do you think you can start on that while I get the crew together? Sure, sure, said Steve, grabbing a script. I'll have a crack at it while I'm having a quick dump. Mm, thanks for sharing, I said. You're welcome, James, said Steve, as he darted off towards the nearest toilet. Deciding that I too needed a toilet visitation before corralling the troops into some kind of order, I slipped out of the green room and made my way towards the main stairs. Before I could reach the first step, however, I collided with an immovable slab of a cinematographer. Danny had obviously been hiding in some long grass and waiting for me to lose the protection of the herd. Having made his well-timed move, he was now resolutely blocking my advance and demanding satisfaction. They won't match, Danny said, somewhat obliquely. Uh, what won't match? I asked with trepidation. The exterior car shots aren't going to match what was shot earlier. Oh, I'm sure it'll be fine, I said, in the dementedly vain hope that this might prompt Danny to say, Oh, Thanks for alleviating my worries, James. Once again, your knowledge and filmmaking experience at this level has put my mind at rest. I shall bother you no longer and let you get on with your job. Instead, Adani turned the valve to maximum 
on a tank marked liquid condescension, highly toxic, and squirted the following in my direction. No, it won't be fine, James. The light has completely altered. It was sunny earlier, now we have intermittent clouds. Not only that, but the sun itself has moved, thereby not only altering its direction, but also diminishing its intensity. Which means, when it comes to the edit, the light in the earlier car scene won't match what we are about to shoot now, even though it is meant to be one and the same shot. Regrettably, the accumulative result of this scheduling misjudgment is that the scene will lose credibility in the eyes of the audience, who will subsequently and instantaneously disengage from the action due to a gross error in lighting continuity. I swear Danny said all of the above without pausing for breath. His eloquent and scathing delivery also smacked of a short rehearsal period and at least three rough drafts. It was fast becoming apparent that I had inadvertently employed a human-cyborg hybrid capable, when it so wished, of rendering me speechless. Well, virtually speechless. Isn't it the earth that moves, Danny? I finally responded with a half-hearted smile. What? snapped Danny, failing to pick up on the fact that I was attempting to lighten the mood a bit in response to his dreary diatribe. Well, you said the sun has moved, I mumbled, bewildered and staggered in equal measure by my ability to end up on such pointless, precipitous paths. Yes, it has. Well, it hasn't really, has it? I continued, determined to really go for it and smack my burning aircraft into the nearest primary school. It's the, um, well, it's it's the earth that uh, moves, surely. Danny remained stock still and silent for a good 15 seconds. Perhaps my fatuous response to his concerns had triggered some sort of short circuit. Or maybe, and more worryingly, his temporary immobilisation was due to the fact that he was busy accessing his anti-crap producer weapon systems. If the latter was the case, and I was indeed on the verge of being blasted by his onboard laser cannon, then I hoped that he'd just get on with it, as I really, really needed to pee. Right, well, anyway, I thought I ought to just flag that up for you, said Danny finally, just so you are aware of the ramifications. Yeah, don't worry, Danny. Can confirm that said ramifications are now successfully logged on the fuck all we can do about it now production sheet. Yes, appreciate you flagging that up for me, Danny, I said, giving him a light and totally disingenuous pat on his shoulder. Anyway, mustache, got a got a bladder to empty. I was about to scamper up the stairs when the pack descended. These weren't the fifty or so excitable, slobbering beagles that we had encountered earlier on that day, but the infinitely more tenacious and indefatigable hellhounds that were my production team. Obviously, the word on the street was that the producer was out in the open, and therefore fair game. Have you got an estimated wrap time for tea, James? barked Lucy, rapidly approaching me from along the corridor. Ah, James, there you are quietly growled Gemma, descending down the stairs towards me. I really need to confirm those measurements for your police uniform. Hey, James, said Amy, our props girl. Have you got a minute to discuss this sword prop you're after? Having been pinned down by Danny, I had been caught, or, more to the point, caught short, in a classic pincer movement. There was only one exit left open to me, and that was to my immediate left and through the main hall. As I began to make my move, I noticed Lucy speeding up in an attempt to block my only line of retreat. James, hang on a minute, Lucy called after me, but it was too late. By the time Lucy stepped into the hall, I had already disappeared through a door on the other side. It took me a while to navigate my way through the house, but eventually I came across a vacant toilet in an eerily quiet corner of the building. Having successfully taken on Danny and then broken through an attempted encircling manoeuvre by the girls, it dawned on me that I might just be learning some basic film survival skills. It was about bloody time really, as the day had smacked broadside after broadside into my reeling hull, and this longest of days was far from over. Having relieved myself and girded up my loins in preparedness for the next bout of madness, I swung open the door and immediately kicked Lucy in the shin. Ouch, said Lucy, quite understandably. Jesus, Lucy, I said, also quite understandably, given the fact that she had scared the living daylights out of me. Did you follow me here? 
I mean, have you got fucking sniffer dogs or something? No, I didn't follow you, James. Look, I wanted to speak to you, but contrary to what you might imagine, I do have 20 trillion other things to attend to, and I certainly don't have the time or the inclination to hunt you down like you're some sort of prize fucking deer. Oh, right, I said, returning to my more familiar back foot position and thoroughly unmanned by Lucy's dressing down. Oh, you know, it just seemed a bit of a coincidence that you, you know, you ended up in this neck of the woods, I said. Yes, well, the other toilets were engaged and I really needed to use the bathroom, James. It was at this point that I noticed that Lucy was carrying a small green box of tampons. Fortunately, I didn't have to hand a brace of marine flares. Otherwise, I'm sure that the idiotically suicidal part of me would have launched them high into the sky to the accompaniment of me shouting, Hear ye! Hear ye! I was right! Lucy has been having PMT, which is why she's been so fecking arsy. Foolishly, however, I made no effort to disguise the fact that I had spotted the tampons. Ah, I see, I said, staring at the box and nodding to myself. Then, just to make sure that the hole I was rapidly excavating was deep enough, I added the words, "Ah, It all makes sense now. What did you say? Lucy said, finally erupting. Whoops. In fact... Huge, mega fucking whoops. Um, I said it, uh, it all makes sense now that you, um, looked elsewhere. You know, once you'd discovered that all the other toilets were engaged. Understandably, Lucy didn't look impressed by this atrociously lame attempt at extricating myself from the situation. I continued on regardless, however, hoping that my inane babble would somehow confuse her in the same way I had bamboozled Danny earlier. It showed initiative, which is exactly what you excel at, Lucy. Initiative and self-control. Yes, yes, self-control. Your ability not to completely lose your rag in difficult circumstances. And also compassion. Yes, that's something else I've come to appreciate about you, Lucy. Your deep compassion in the face of shut up, James, snapped Lucy, saving us both from being further drenched in verbiage. Yes, uh, will do, I said in my best timid floppy rabbit voice. I got the impression that Lucy might just spare my life this time round, but erring on the side of safety, I lowered my head into the universally accepted position of male submission before a superior female. Oh, uh, and in answer to your earlier question, uh, Lucy, I think tea will be at six-ish, I added, hoping this would round off my efforts for rapprochement and make us bestest of chums again. Yeah, whatever, Lucy said kicking the loo door open with what looked very much to me like a well-practised karate kick. I was marginally tempted to rebuke her for battering an 18th century door, but then good sense prevailed, and I moved swiftly out of kicking range and back towards the front line. (laughs) 